Well, they're considered invasive animals. In parts of Hampton Roads, their population is growing. They have the potential to cause you big problems. And tonight, 13 News Now anchor Vanessa Coria investigates hogs going wild in Virginia and the efforts to control them. Wild pigs, boars, swine, whatever you want to call them, they're running wild in both the refuge and at False Cape State Park, and if they aren't stopped, they could move into your neighborhood. If you visualize a pig turning over the, 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 the ground in a, in a farmer's soybean field or, or, a, or a corn field, it would be a disaster for that farmer. John Gallegos with Back Bay and Peter Auker with the state are both wildlife biologists on the front lines of Virginia's ongoing battle with the feral pig population, and they have the animals under surveillance, cameras like this tracking their every move. If we weren't doing any control activity at all with them, then the, po the population would rapidly explode. That's where hunting and trapping come in. There are about a dozen traps just like this one set up in the refuge and state park baited with corn. Here's what happens when the pigs bite. As he does so, he pulls on the line and it breaks. It's estimated right now there are several dozen of the pigs confined to the Back Bay and False Cape. The problem is they breed fast and they have lots and lots of babies. You can see from these recent surveillance photos, these mamas have new litters. They can reproduce as early, less than a year old. They can have several litters a year of four to six to eight um, piglets each litter. Um, so they can reproduce like crazy. Nutria, huge hungry 20-pound rodents native to South America, have been wreaking environmental havoc for years. And on Maryland's eastern shore, a team of wildlife biologists and trappers is working to stop the invasive critter from gobbling up wetlands. From a regional perspective, this project is important to the health of the Chesapeake Bay. From a national perspective, the techniques that we're developing here are ap applicable in other parts of the country where similar types of ecological damage are taking place. Nutria are perfect eating machines, with webbed feet, hand-like paws, strong front teeth, and a head nearly one-third of its total body size. Fur traders brought the species to North America in the 1930s, but the pelts never caught on, and many of the animals that were brought to Louisiana, Florida, Oregon, and Maryland either escaped or were released. Pretty much wherever Nutria have become established, they've become a problem in the U.S. One such problem area is along the Chesapeake Bay. I recently visited the Deal Island Management Area in southeastern Maryland to see firsthand how these animals can devastate the environment and what's being done to stop them. We're starting to see a little bit of damage here. This is the, the kind of initial feeding uh, activity that we'll see when nutrient move into an area. And this is the kind of digging they do. I mentioned they dig up the root mat and here are little pieces of it that they've dug up and, and chewed on the roots and tubers. When the tide moves in, these tattered remains get swept away, leaving an unstable, monkey hole where a marsh used to be. All of this stuff I'm walking in right now is erodible. It's, it's mud, essentially. And without the roots of those plants to bind it together, it's highly vulnerable to disappearing. That's what happened at the nearby Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. Nutria invaded and wiped out more than half the marsh there. In the mid-1990s, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources teamed up with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other federal agencies to assess the nutria problem in the refuge. By 2004, trappers had killed about 10,000 rodents, and Blackwater was declared virtually nutria-free. Now it's Deal Island's turn. Parts of the Bay Area are under attack by an invasive vine. Our Jason Beisel shows you how the state is turning to Asian beetles to battle against this growing problem. Take a walk around Largo Central Park Nature Preserve and you will notice these heart-shaped leafy plants. Problem is, they don't belong here. But somebody uh, probably thought they were a good-looking vine um, when they went to Asia, brought them back here as well. The air potato vine is considered the most invasive species in Florida. Once it makes itself at home, it overtakes and kills native plants. Starts shading out the natives, fight, fights it for sunlight, uh, water, and nutrients. 
Since the air potato vine grows about 70 feet every summer, it doesn't take long for it to do its damage. Just take a look at what it's done here, where it's devoured everything in its sight, all the way from the ground up through the trees. We uh, use Roundup and they won't, it doesn't even yellow it. They sort of laugh that off. So the state's newest weapon? And you can see that they're already starting to uh, do damage to the air potato vine. The air potato leaf beetle. Uh, they chew holes in the leaves, damage the actual plant, and then they'll lay their eggs on the actual plant itself, and a whole new generation will hatch out and start chewing on the leaves again. On Tuesday, 300 beetles were released around Largo. It's part of the state's plan to combat the air potato vine infestation. So far this year, 30,000 beetles have been released across the state. At Largo Central Park Nature Preserve, the beetles are already getting to work. None of these leaves had holes in them uh, last night or, or yesterday when we put these out. An ongoing battle to eradicate the giant African land snail has been taking place in the Miami-Dade area of Florida since September 2011. The critter at hand can grow to almost 8 inches long with a 5 inch diameter and carry both male and female reproductive organs. Combine this with the fact that they can reproduce faster than rabbits and have no natural predators, it is not surprising that their population numbers quickly spiral out of control. They are in the top 100 invasive species list and are a particular concern to the Florida Department of Agriculture because they can consume up to 500 different species of plants. If they were to escape the city and move into Florida's orchards and crop fields, the impacts could be devastating. Not to mention they carry a strain of parasite called ratworm that can transfer meningitis to humans. Luckily through a campaign of television, radio and print ads, residents have become aware of the growing problem and have played a crucial part in identifying and reporting any sightings to an official helpline. This has facilitated in the eradication of over 110,000 snails. So officials are optimistic that it is now just a matter of time until the giant African land snail is completely eliminated. They are not out of the woodworks yet, and at cost of around $3 million so far, this has become an expensive lesson, but a lesson nonetheless. There's a new invader on the block. A ferocious fish with a massive appetite and razor-sharp teeth. It may even walk on land. The snakehead. It represents a, a, an introduction of something that can compete and possibly outcompete um, the native fishes. A northern snakehead reaches sexual maturity by age two or three. Each spawning age female can release up to 15,000 eggs at once. Snakeheads can mate as often as five times a year. This means in just two years, a single female can release up to 150,000 eggs. In a natural habitat where predators and prey work in balance, fast breeding's kept in check. But in a foreign ecosystem where natural predators are missing, it can lead to a disastrous population explosion. Snakeheads are also known to lash out at any who approach them. Of the 29 known snakehead varieties, many, like the giant snakehead, are powerful hunters with ravenous appetites and sharp, snapping jaws. Jaws that can tear flesh, even human flesh. At first, I wasn't quite sure what bit me. I saw a lot of blood on my arm. I thought I was lucky it didn't hurt me that much. They can bite your entire hand off. In the U.S., snakehead attacks are just a small part of their danger. To an ecosystem, invading snakeheads pose a far greater threat. Outside its natural habitat, the northern variety can decimate a food chain. These fish are top-level predators that will eat virtually anything in their path. They can travel across land and live out of water for up to three days. On land, snakeheads use a primitive lung above their gills. They have these air chambers just up underneath the, the skull, so they'll rise to the surface, gulp air, that air is forced up into those air chambers, which acts in, in many respects like a lung. To complete this monstrous picture, some say the snakehead can do something few other fish can, walk on land. Out of the water, snakeheads rhythmically move their fins and muscular bodies back and forth. It's the fish equivalent of walking. And if snakeheads do in fact use this ability to cover distances above water, it's a resourceful adaptation. Walking on land could mean the difference between life and death. 
As the battle of man versus snakehead continues, biologists and fishermen refuse to sit back and wait. They monitor population growth, study DNA, and gather as much information as possible, hoping to find a clue to the best way to control this frankenfish. Only time will tell how dangerous this foreign predator is to the ecosystem. But one thing's clear, the snakehead has already earned the title of an unforgettable fish